cold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. All right. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just ask uh, some basic questions, but if you could sure. answer my question with starting with rephrasing the question at the beginning as okay. much as you can. Okay. Um, so first, if you could just tell me your name and what you do. Okay, I'm Kath Matthews, and I am a musician, sound artist, composer, person. Yeah. Um, so uh, at some point, I think a lot of people sort of associated you uh, you're one of the representing artists of Stein, I think, at some point. You're mm. using, well, at least in my mind, uh, um, you're using Lisa. and um, So maybe you could tell me a little bit about your connection to Stein. Sure. I mean, I first discovered Stein when I was doing a master's at York University in England in 1990. And Stein was this amazing, miraculous place in Holland that um, made mu uh, instruments for the performance of electronic music. And I was playing the violin at the time. I had a MIDI violin. I was doing stuff with a sampler. And I was trying to do these improvised performances and finding that I was very restricted in what I could do live, fresh. Um, and by coming to Stein in, I think, 93, and did his, dropped in and met people and was showed, showed around, I was told that I could actually apply to have a, a residency here. So I did, and I, I came along and did one of those weeks, I can't remember what they're called, orientation weeks, that's right. And I played with various bits of software for a week and left very excited, and then wrote a proposal about what I wanted to do with a violin. And... Um, we were going to put me with, um, it wasn't, yeah, Big Eye. We were going to actually have used Big Eye so that I could play the violin and my gesture was going to be used to translate as action to control sound or information to control sound processing. And um, so I was invited to come for a month or two months, I think it was. And it was January 1996, and I remember the day well, and I drove here in my little car, and it was freezing cold. I got out of the car and fell flat on my ass because the streets were covered in ice. And uh, the next day, I was in this room, I think, with Frank, and and um, I can't remember the name of the other guy. He was great. He went and left and worked for someone else. Anyway, him, and um, we sat and talked about what I wanted to do, and they both said, actually, no, and Nick Collins, of course. And we sat and talked about what I wanted to do. And they all said, no, 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 Kath, it sounds like um, Big Eye's the wrong thing. We think you should work with Lisa, this new bit of software we're just developing. My immediate response was, no, I'm not going on stage with a computer. Because in those days, you know, a computer was a great big thing. And they said, but you're already using a computer. It's a sampler. And I said, a sampler, a computer? Yeah, I guess it is in a way. OK. And they said, no, 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 laptops are being invented and they're small and portable. So I said, okay, then show me this bit of software. So we went downstairs and I plugged in my violin and immediately I could play and I could hear stuff that was not the violin, but I had the gesture of the violin in my hands. And I was like, yeah, okay, guys, this is it. Great. So I was here in that studio downstairs for like a month and uh, every day at it all the time. And I would come upstairs and say to Frank, Frank, could you make it do this? It crashes when I do this. And because they were, you know, beta testing it. And there were some times when Frank would say, actually, Kaf, no, um, I, can't, I, I can't give you a yes or no on that. Um, you need to talk to Michelle. So I'd go out for dinner with Michelle. We'd go to this Turkish restaurant just down the road here, and we'd talk. And I'd, I'd talk, because, for example, Lisa was mono to start with. And I was saying, no, come on, Lisa has to be stereo. We have to address the stereo landscape. I was very into position and motion of sound. And, uh, well, that was the beginning of it. Of course, I still am. And um, so uh, we would have these long dinners and I would talk about all this kind of stuff. And uh, lo and behold, the next day, Lisa would be stereo. So that was kind of very much how I was involved in the design of Lisa, really. And that was very much the beginning of my my musical, professional musical life, actually. It was kind of from then on that I, I left my job. I just left my job, and I have been working freelance as a musician, composer, sound artist ever since. You guys could come in and email oh. that. Um, okay. Um, Sorry, that was a bit long. No, no, that's great. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's, really what, that's really what happened. Okay. 
So so you started as a violinist and then you combined it with electronics. Uh Mhm. Yeah [noise] Yeah. [noise] Mm. Is is it really two instruments? [laughs] Yeah, I think so. Is it the wooden one? Yeah, the wooden one. Oh, okay. The electric, the electric one? Actually I think it's the wooden one. The wooden one is better. I find the wooden one actually is the best sounding. Yeah. I've never tried it. Have you tried it? Every instrument has its own sound. Oh yeah. You can tell like each instrument cuz I've played this instrument before, I can't tell you what instrument it is. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, I've read about it before. Fifty five thousand hours of music. Yeah. [laughs] [laughs] Wow, that's a lot of music. Yeah. Well, I went through a couple of gigs in Japan, so there was that. Mm. Oh. Just to let people know. Yeah. And they were just amazed. Oh yeah, they are amazed. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah, they're like Oh. [laughs] Two instruments with like双drums. [noise] Snare drum and bass. Drums. Beautiful. Yeah, they're like four instruments together. Four? Okay. Cuz if you're a pianist, you don't want to have that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Plus if you're trying to go from one end to the other end, it's like twang. [laughs] Yeah, mhm. Yeah. [noise] Oh yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. [laughs] Yeah, so if I was trying to find that kind of music I would go, well, I would go from one end to the other end. Mm. Right? [noise] Mhm. Oh, yeah, and if I'm trying to go like this, I wanna stay where I am. Mhm. Yeah. Right? And then, that's what drove me to Berlin. I wanted to find somewhere that I could actually play the piano and play really well. Mhm. Yeah. So Berlin is like an opera town in itself. Mm. Yeah. It, it's so beautiful there. Mhm. It's so nice. Yeah. Um, I actually was hoping that I was gonna move there this year, but I just haven't been able to find anywhere to play. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been meaning to go back to Europe. But my friend was like, "Just come like after Easter or something." And I was like, "Okay." Yeah. So I definitely fall into the Europe bandwagon, this year. Oh yeah, you've got to go. I've been wanting to go. I've been really wanting to go. Yeah. Rafael Nadal's hometown. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of going there. Yeah. I know he's going to Turkey. I was thinking of maybe going to Cannes. You know Cannes, right? Oh yeah, you've got to go there. When he comes back. Yeah. I know. I've been wanting to go there. Do you know what I've been wanting to do? What's that? Um, that thing where you can like make a little mini mini golf. Oh, like a ball? Oh. Yeah. Like a mini golf. Oh. I've never done that before. Yeah. [noise] You should do it. It's like a [inaudible 0:45:41.68] thing. Yeah. [noise] Or like a mini golf. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. [noise] Or like the, the ones that you, like this little pad that you hold. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We had a golf outing. Yeah. Did you go golfing? No, I just played golf. [laughs] Oh, okay. [laughs] Yeah, that's a good time. Like when, in the morning? That's when you, like, that's when you get done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. [noise] Yeah. Um, so then you don't wake up with the cramps and everything, and you start playing till seven, right? Oh, no. So the golf clubs are like a half an hour away and they meet like half an hour in the morning. Oh, yeah. And then they come back for dinner and then Yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, basically everyone just hangs out and watches us play. Yeah. [noise] Yeah, that's pretty much what happens. Oh, yeah, I know. [laughs] Yeah, at least three quarters of the time it happens. Yeah, during the day. Yeah. 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 Yeah, basically. Yeah, at least three quarters of the time it happens. Yeah, well, there's sometimes three quarters of it happens all at once, right? Okay. [noise] Yeah. 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 Yeah
sonic bears, you'd actually be feeling this music. And, okay, these bass sounds. What we're looking at now is, a, is the patch I use to distribute the, the, the sound, the music. So I compose the music line in a bed, a sonic bed, which has 12, a 12 channel sound system inside it. And there are six subwoofers under the mattress um, and eight mids and tweeters in panels around the side. So these, um, I need a long pointer, but I haven't got one. But uh, these here are the, the woofers that will be underneath you. And then around the outside are the other speakers hidden in panels around you. So you're lying in the bed and you get this uh, massage. So it's going up and down your back and it's spinning around you. And you know, it might sound like it's quite a nice thing to do, but maybe not that interesting. But in actual fact, a sonic bed was something that I made. And you know how it is you make something and you don't necessarily know what you're making until you've made it. And then you make it, and people, you make you finish it just before the opening, and you go, oh my god, actually this is really interesting. There's something quite, you know, in special going on here. Um, so I'm just going to show you a picture of some, and they should be here. Oops, that's not quite something, but here we go. Um, <clears throat> because Okay, this in fact is the original Sonic bed, and um, you might wonder what on earth I was doing making a Sonic bed. I could tell you very briefly. I could, I suppose, first of all, say, Hi, I'm Kath Matthews, thank you very much for coming. It's really, really nice to be at Stein again. I haven't been here for a long time. Stein has a very special place in my heart, in my work. It really kicked me off into my professional musical life. Anyway. So after, from 96, when I was here working with Lisa in the early days of Lisa software, um, I have been working, making solo concerts around the world until about 2005, when I said, ah, hold on a moment, actually, I need to stop um, making these concerts just for people uh, who know about this kind of music. I realized that most of the people at the concerts that I was doing were generally young, male, white, they already made this kind of music, they knew about it, they went because they kind of knew how to deal with it. Whereas the normal person on the street never got access to it. Um, and I realized by, kind of by chance, because I made a couple of sonic armchairs, uh, you know, like you do, and uh, I, I, got a, I got an armchair and I put um, a woofer, subwoofer under the seat and mids and tweeters, mid bass speakers up the back and tweeters here in the wings and made these very simple pieces that looped with a filter over time so that you got the sense of the sound moving up and down your body. And these chairs people really liked and I realized that old women and kids were queuing for an hour to have a ride in one of these chairs. And I thought, hold on a minute, you know, there's something in this. If I played this music to these people through speakers, they'd say, give me a break, love, where's the tune, you know? So I thought, okay, let's, let's work on that. Fortunately, I was um, invited to make the work for an exhibition in London in 2005. And they were interested in my sonic furniture. And I said, yeah, chair's great, but actually I'm gonna make a bed because um, basically, we can feel vibration, human animal can feel vibration below 100 hertz. So in other words, you're looking at base territory. So if you work with a sonic armchair, you're a bit restricted in space to put woofers, which is the speakers you want to use if you're going to work with the base frequencies. So I thought, okay, let's make a bed. Um, so I made this bed. and. Uh, you know, I, uh, I had all kinds of ideas and drew it up and it eventually got made. And um, lo and behold, um, that was the first one. Now, the thing that was really inspiring and exciting was, as I've said, was the fact that people definitely had an experience that was completely individual to themselves um, and was quite often an out-of-body experience. People would talk about it. They would say, is the bed moving? They would say, I felt I got sucked in. I got pushed out. I got lifted around. Sorry, can we move 
use the sound. Do you mind just taking the faders right off? There. Yeah. I can still yeah, but hear something. Um, and um, look, all different kinds of people got in the bed. Now, one of the questions that I had, one of the questions about the project to me, to myself, was would would people get into bed with a stranger in a public space? Um, I could say a little bit more about what I was also wanting to do. Having said that I, I wanted to make essentially new music more accessible to wider audiences, um, I also was very much wanting to make music that did not necessarily have a beginning and an end. I didn't want to have to be restricted to the sense of time um, being when the audience comes and when the audience leaves. Was it not possible to consider music as being this already existing series of vibrations that a witness could experience at one moment? In other words, made music that went on, and you, the visitor, the witness, the audience, could experience it for just a certain moment of its existence. And so this is also what I was doing with these beds, was I was working with a number of different people to create ways of making music that could play and always be changing without having to loop. You know, also to give the people who ran the installations a break because they don't want to hear the same thing over and over and over and over. But it meant that people would come back to the bed as well. And every time they got in it, it would play, it would be different to how they had their first time. And um, I was actually really lucky because, as it happened, the very first bed people loved, and um, I got invited to make another bed almost immediately in China, of all places. So I went to Shanghai, and I went there three times, and um, and I said I had suggested to them, I said, look, I'd love to make this bed with this design, but could we make a local version, localized version of the bed? Can we make it in in uh, materials and I want to collaborate with Chinese people to make it. And we did. And um, also I discovered that people responded very differently to the bed. You could get a lot more people inside it, like there were six people in the bed here. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and also look, um, this is hand carved. Um, I went out to China three times and did a lot of research into how furniture was made and the different ways the new traditional techniques. So there were these beautiful hand carved steps and the fabric was totally different. And I was I stayed in China and made recordings in Shanghai from the river and made a piece out of those recordings. Um, and I was here, you know, um, right in the heart of this extraordinary uh, metropolis. These are the British Council actually who came to the opening. Openings in China are kind of wild. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, and you drink sweet tea, and there's so many TV crews there, you don't know what to do. Plus, the mayor's been in at 6 in the morning to decide whether it's okay for this work to be shown. I mean, essentially what happened was, having made the bed in China, I decided that what I wanted to do was, was to make these beds in different countries around the world. I should clarify here what also happened. I set up a, a, collabor a collaborative project called Music for Bodies, which was really inspired by this whole this whole bed making business. Um, business, I don't mean business, I mean creative project. Uh, sorry, can we turn music off? Is it possible? Thanks. Um, so I, um, the World Wide Bed Project essentially was going to be um, using the design of the, different song, of the London bed, but making different versions of this bed in different countries around the world. So this is what I set out to do. The idea being that the bed is an instrument. It doesn't just play my work at all. I would go and I would collaborate with the people who, from, who commissioned it. We would work together to create this, this bed. I would go and make the first piece for it, and then I would um, facilitate other people to run the bed, teach them how the software worked. They could then make their own pieces for it. And I'm not talking just about composers or artists, but also anybody who might be interested. Groups of kids, for example, I've worked with uh, mums and toddlers, um, teenagers, yes, with composers, and so on. Um, and after the Chinese bed, I made the Canadian bed. 
And one of the things that was so interesting that I learned every time that I made a bird uh, in another country was that how the collaboration worked told me so much about the economic uh, and political situation of art within that country. Like working in China, they really, really wanted me to say what people would experience from the work. Okay, like I had to write on a piece of paper, this is what is going to happen to you if you get in this bed. Um, of course, I didn't do that, but it was very interesting to discuss why they wanted that information. Um, working, this, this bed is in, uh, currently it's in an installation in an exhibition in Obero in Montreal. Um, and this was commissioned by Avatar in uh, Quebec City. And I don't know if any of you are from Canada or have worked in Canada, but if you get a chance, work with the Canadians because they are very well funded and they have a lot of talented, kind, interesting, skillful, energetic people who want to work with you. And this collaboration was amazing. We, um, you can't see so well in this photo, unfortunately, but. Um, this, the bar, the outside of the bed is covered in this bark, um, and the cover is made in, it's called Catalone, and um, it's a woven fabric that's made from scraps of cotton that are, are recycled, essentially. Um, and there's a bunch of Canadians in the bed, and uh, you know, having a really nice time. So this is the technology, and look how beautifully that is made. That is by Mariel Lehman in the... Uh, <coughs> At Avatar, so he's the subwoofers, you know, and I was learning a lot every time I made a bed because people would have different interests. And this was the situation I was in. You know, it was minus 25 degrees, so I took a lot of recordings in the river and, um, and made a pretty much weather inspired piece. I could add that, you know, like I say, to make music for these beds, you have to be in the bed because you've got to feel what happens with the music as you're making it to, to compose it. This bed was in Taiwan. That was very interesting. The Taiwanese, they were not interested in any kind of collaboration. They said, no, we want to absolutely replicate this bed. And um, they banged it out within two days. The workmanship is stunning. Everybody else has taken two weeks to do it, but they shot it out in two days, and it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And then this is the Scottish bed. <laughs> And, uh, you know, with the lovely uh, designed hand-knitted cushions. And this is the most recent. This, is, this bed was made in um, Marfa in Texas. Um, and each time I've made a bed, I, you can see they look like fairly luxurious objects. But I try to... Essentially, I, I've been becoming more aware of the need to recycle materials and not spend so much money on art. Really? Can we actually do it without having to make luxury objects? This surface here, this, these panels, are from pieces of uh, plywood that have been up over the windows of abandoned houses, and that have been weathered by the, the sun and the wind, and it was this beautiful... Because Marfa's this tiny little Texan town. Does anybody know Marfa? Land of... where well, there's a big Donald Judd Institute there. It's an extraordinary place. Um, um, hence the plexiglass around the top. And I guess the yellow is kind of inspired by him too. Um, but that is reclaimed uh, plywood from these, from these windows. Um, but this bed, in fact, is now in New York, uh, issue project room, and it's probably going to stay there relatively permanently. That was the, this brilliant local guy who did this electricity for the theatre. And that was Texas. And that's the place I was in to make music. What I'm trying to tell you is that um, location has always been a really important part of my, of my practice. Um, when I started off with using this software, Lisa, that was designed here at Stein, um, I used to always have a microphone in the same space that I was playing in and outside so that I would be grabbing sound during the concert and bringing in an element of chance, but actually being very literal about the place I was in. Um, and certainly making those beds with those compositions, each one totally reflected that, not to mention the people that I was working with at the time. By the way, has anybody got any questions? If you think, yes? Well, I have a question. Yes. Because I saw in the Mexican bed that you had speakers around the people 
Yes. And they were open, and in the other beds they were not. Yes. Does that mean that only in this bed you have a full range system? No, no. Uh, oh, no. Did we, did we see them? You didn't see coming. them. It's like each bird, the, the oh. design has kind of got okay. slightly altered by the people I've worked oh. with. I mean, they've always been a really, really involved collaboration. Um, yeah, and that one, they were, I wanted to show them. I think, it's, I think that started in Scotland, actually, uh -huh. that bit, taking the side off. Okay, well, um, what time is it? Because I could go for two hours, and I know that I really don't have much time. Does anybody know what the time is? Okay. Um, now, I'll tell you about this next project. No, I won't. I'm going to hide this from him. Let's quit that. Can I get rid of you? Mm. Okay, let's get rid of this. I want to show you a project. Yeah, if you want to know about my work, go. you can go to this website. If you're looking here, uh, the next piece I want to tell you about is this. The reason I'm going to tell you about this piece, the Marvello project, is that I think there are fundamentally three kind of interesting things about talking about music for bodies, just in relation to the life of a, a solo um, musician, artist, composer, like how a practice can develop or evolve. I mean, essentially, you know, even so, this evening somebody said to me, uh, Kath, but I, I gather that you were a biologist and then you got into sound. How did that happen? And um, I was thinking, oh, well, I did do a zoology degree, yeah, but I've never been a biologist, you know. I mean, this whole kind of music mission that I'm on has just been a trajectory that's kind of happened, really. But it's definitely, it's one that's continuously evolving. And so going from, you know, 10 years, pretty much, traveling all over the place, doing performances, making concerts, making albums, um, I haven't released an album since, I think, 2005, this solo uh, piece, simply because the stereo format became irrelevant to the work that I was making. So the CDs are like, psh, not worth it, weren't relevant at the time. And Music for Bullies was, uh, is a really important part of actually developing a way of making work that could be played through this multi-channel situation. So I wasn't relying on a multi-channel venue, um, but I essentially these, you know, these beds are venues, they're portable venues, and they play to small numbers of audiences, really. Um, and I don't have to be there to play it. So that's one thing. But the other thing is the actual um, kind of composition techniques, I suppose you could say, or ideas that I've developed through working with this uh, multi-channel situation. That also involves uh, vibration and a tangible contact with music. And actually, I think I've always had a really involved physical connection to music. I mean, my beginning was a violin at stage six or whatever. So you, I've always had this, you know, I mean, maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's because I've always had this kind of wooden box as being the contact with sound. But it's actually always, always been there. And so the Music for Bodies project is about, yes, making new ways for people to experience music. Yes, working with multi-channel. Um, but also to be able to experience music through your whole body rather than just through your ears. I mean, the human animal is something that experiences sound, music, through all our senses. It's not just you know, these little pinkies. Um, but part of that um, has been also this develop development of wanting to be able to articulate music in space. So the Marvello project was something that I think is also um, an extension of the Music for Bodies. What is the Marvello project? It was, very briefly, I was invited to make a site-specific work for a town called Folkestone in England, which is a, a pretty depressed has been pretty depressed, economically town, because of the fact that their port closed and very little uh, work was available. Anyway, there was a big um, triennial there a couple of years ago, and I was asked to make a site-specific work. I said, I want to work with people from the town. And I said, oh, what, what I want to do is to work with a bunch of kids, maybe, or teenagers, I imagined. In the end, I've got 11-year-olds. If you ever get a chance to work with 11-year-olds, do the best. They're old enough to have 
know, independent ideas and young enough to be not distracted by adolescence and they were just <laughs> amazing. And I had a posse of 12 of them and I, you know, I said, right, we're a, we're a posse of artists, we're working together. Your, your ideas are as important as yours, you know. And we, we looked at a map, this is a map of their town, of Folkestone, and um, we marked where everybody lived, we went out on the streets, we took recordings, we looked at the routes that they took on the streets, and, uh, and then we um, came back into the lab with our recordings, played them, processed them, I showed them how to use this free software um, that's a totally legit bit of free PC software so that they could you know, make their own pieces. And we were working in little duos and trios and making these crazy little pieces. And all together we made 67, actually no, 72, I think, little pieces in the end, which we mapped out all over the town. Um, so these pink areas, what you're looking at, these pink areas actually are different um, area zones of streets that we decided a specific piece of music should be played along the street. Because essentially what I was wanting to do was make an opera for the town. An opera that would just hang in the air, invisible, and then if you took out one of our special Marvello bicycles, ka one of these, so there they are, then you would actually, um, you would be able to, here we are, let's have a look at the Marvello bike. You would be able to, oh, this is meant, you know. Um, you would be able to hear the music because what I did was that on the bikes we had little computers carrying the, the music, 69 MP3s or whatever they were, and uh, each one with a specific series of uh, GPS coordinates and GPS receivers on the bikes. Um, and uh, here we go. Um, I'm sorry, the, the projector's a bit, we can't see the pictures so well. Um, <coughs> So each, as you cycle the bikes around the town, basically the, you turn the corner and the, the music would play. You go down one street, you get one piece, go down another street, you get another piece. And it was the first time I worked with GPS. It's incredibly accurate. Um, and it was fun because we designed all these different kinds of bikes from the second-hand bikes that I picked up in London and, you know, available for all different kinds of, all different kinds of cyclists. And we had um, we had a, a shop in the town with all the bicycles, and they were there. It's running for two months, and visitors to the exhibition, which ran all through the summer, could come to the bike, to the shop, take out the bike for free, and cycle around. And as well as the fact that they had a lot of fun, um, because they were cycling around the town, having their own audio complement, um, they were also being performers. So passers-by were getting a lot of a lot of amusement from that. Isn't um, that, uh, I mean, it's, just, it's kind of obvious, but isn't that extremely dangerous? <laughs> well, it's not as dangerous as it, as it is cycling with, you know, with um, headphones. Yeah. That, is, that is dangerous. I'm not saying that's not dangerous, I'm just... <laughs> why, why, do you think it, why do you think it's dangerous? Well, I mean, particularly here in Holland with the amount of bicycles and well, pedestrians and cars, I mean, I'm just curious, like, at, at what point this thought would enter into your artistic process. <laughs> well, do you know, actually, I mean, I've got to be really brief here, which is why I haven't gone into any detail on that project at all, but uh, security, safety, and health, public health issues, blah, 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 were kind of pretty paramount, which is why I took a long time to actually figure out how to attach the speakers to the bikes so that you didn't have the weight on your handlebars. So that, I mean, so that the, the fulcrum of the central piece of the bike held the speakers up. I mean, you're right, in as much as people might be cycling down a narrow, or not a narrow, but a quiet suburban kind of side street, and get totally tripped out on the glory of this wonderful music. Because some of the music was amazing, like, you know, great. We did things like we put great big string, swelling string pieces inside the extraordinary recordings of the sea and then play this up these beautiful streets, you know, white Georgian houses where you couldn't see the sea, but you'd hear it. And there are all these hedges going around. And I mean, when I was trying to actually make the design the speakers and all that kind of thing for the bikes, people would say to me, oh, love, use headphones, you know, much easier. I said, no, 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 that's the only reason why. 
And then they say, oh, no, love, you'd never get stereo on a bicycle. Just have yeah. one speaker right here. I say, no, no, God, I'm sorry. The stereo is awesome. I mean, it's really, really great. It's incredible. And when you cycle down streets with lots of houses in Amsterdam, it would be brilliant. Um, you get this really good stereo effect. And yes, you're right, it could be dangerous because your street is turned into, and you are turned into being in a movie. Everything. <laughs> no, 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 it was totally about making music. I mean, it very much, I made music with the kids. Um, so, and we had all kinds of extraordinary pieces that ranged from, for example, one, I mean, two things happened. One was they had never used decent digital recorders before. They'd never heard themselves recorded. So there was all that going on, discovering, recording the sound out in the street and then listening to it and then chopping it up and making music. That was that completely what we did. And, um, and so then- So you brought street sounds back to the street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they were they were also, you know, you know what eleven year old kids are like. They they've got their own ideas about pop songs, they're downloading stuff from the internet, they were singing like hell. I mean they were making all kinds of amazing pieces. And uh, and then but at the same time I was trying to introduce to them the concept of looking at a route, you know, like a, a way, a, a particular path through a series of streets as as a score. Okay, this is a score. How might you make a piece of music for this? So that was going on as well. And one little boy was amazing. For example, he went to, um, there are two McDonald's in this town. He made a recording of him and his friend in there slurping on milkshakes and lunching burgers and made this really mean little piece that went on and on and on. He even got some of the kids to, to do a rap. He wrote this kind of McDonald's rap. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we had to map it out so that to hear this whole piece, you had to cycle from one McDonald's to the other. You know, that was, that was where you would be able to hear that piece. So things like this happen. So yeah, no, it was very much about the kids making music, which again is why it's actually a really interesting piece to do in other, in other cities. So if anybody was, you know, interested in something like that here, talk, talk to you. Um, yeah, now I, I, should, I should stop pretty soon. I just wanted to end with the latest thing, the, where the bikes took me, was, uh, was the ocean. I, um, I went to Galapagos last year, and um, I dived with hammerhead sharks and had an extraordinary experience. And actually, I've done that wrong, haven't I? I should have my whole career, so... Um, Okay, so that anyway is one of our Marvello, the Marvello girls. You can see the wonderful bikes. They had trickle, solar powered trickle chargers on them to char keep the batteries totted up. And here are the stereo speakers on carefully designed, safe, NET conscious speaker mount. Um, uh, all right. What we'll do though is just go through all these. I just want to. So, yeah, I ended up in uh, Galapagos and uh, was working with these shark scientists. So I was diving with hammerhead sharks for a week and then working with shark scientists who were giving me all this tracking data about where these sharks go. And I'm using that to make a work, an audio visual work, that I will be completing next year. But I was really lucky as well to be able to work with a group of kids, and I'm mentioning them specifically because these kids were the same age, but they lived in this tiny little town where they had to go to the mayor's office to get on the internet. They were not internet savvy in any way whatsoever. We had one computer, which was my laptop, and one sp speaker, which was a computer speaker, the other one didn't work. And we were in a shed together for a week, and we made <coughs> incredible music that we played the way to get it out there was on the local radio station. Um, and that was that was really quite amazing. And I would like to play you a piece, but I think there's not really time. So instead, I'll tell you where it is. So look, these are, these are sharks. And now I wasn't in the cage, and yes, they were that close. And um, yeah, the underwater world is an extraordinary thing, and is the the space that I'm kind of currently exploring for music making. 
Okay. The piece I wanted to. Um, how do we do this? <coughs> yeah, if you go to here, you can see it here. It's this one, sharks. <laughs> Thanks very much.
that make good sense? I thought I'd like to add adding crypto add one. Our next event is next week. We have turntable music night. It's been a year since we did it last time. We have some great turntables from around the world. And our next hot pot lab is June 3rd. We have Chris Carter from Darby Whistle and John Richards here. And John Rose from Australia and Golden Fur from Australia. So all this stuff will be announced on the mailing list. If you're not on there, sign your name up. If you're already on there, sign somebody's name. 